Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Well, welcome to the 106th Landon Lecture on Public Issues. The Landon Lecture series was started in 1966 by the late governor of Kansas, Alf Landon. In December of that year, Governor Landon gave the first lecture entitled New Challenges in International Relations. It is extremely fitting and appropriate that we have on the Landon platform today, now some 30 years later, Dr. Henry Kissinger, who has played such an extraordinarily important role in the foreign policy of the United States of America. There are some uncanny connections between the political views of Governor Alf Landon and the actions and views of Henry Kissinger in his role as advisor to the President on national security affairs and later as Secretary of State under President Richard Nixon. For example, in 1966, Governor Landon called for the normalization of relations with Communist China. Landon thought that it was absurd that the largest and most powerful nations in the world lived in such a state of ignorance and mistrust of one another. In 1966, Landon wrote, and I quote, long ago, I said the United Nations could not succeed in its objectives if it left out communist China." Unquote. It was Henry Kissinger who made the secret visits to the People's Republic of China to arrange the first dramatic breakthrough in normalizing our relations with the PRC, which occurred during the first term of Richard Nixon's presidency. Well, in addition, Governor Landon claimed that the Manila Conference of President Lyndon Johnson was, quote, a complete failure as far as any agreement on any Vietnam peace settlement is concerned, unquote. Landon objected to President Johnson's dramatic pronouncement that the United States is a major Asian power and is assuming guardianship in its name over all of Asia. This appears to be an assertion of national responsibility of appalling proportions, unquote. So, while the Manila Conference that Governor Landon was referring to was one of the first attempts at resolving the American involvement in Vietnam, the role that Dr. Kissinger played in the ultimate end of the Vietnam conflict is well known. Before I formally introduce Dr. Kissinger, let me introduce to you other members of the platform party. On my left, Dr. John Havlin, faculty senate president and professor of agronomy. Next to him, the newly elected student body president of Kansas State University, Chris Hansen, and a junior in nuclear engineering. <laughs> On my right, Mr. Edward Seaton, chairman of the Landon Patrons and owner and publisher of the Manhattan Mercury. <laughs> Next to him is Dr. Charles Reagan, chairman of the Landon Lecture Series and my executive assistant. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Henry Kissinger was sworn in on September 22, 1973, as the 56th Secretary of State of the United States. He held this position until January 20th of 1977. Before that, he has served as Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs from early 1969 to late 1975. Dr. Kissinger, as you might remember, received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1973 for his work in bringing the Vietnam War to a conclusion. In 1977, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, this nation's highest civilian award. And in 1986, he received the Medal of Liberty. Dr. Kissinger was born in Germany and came to the United States in 1938. He became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1943 and served in the U.S. Army from 1943 to 1946. He then graduated summa cum laude from Harvard and later received both his master's and Ph.D. degrees from Harvard as well. From 1954 until 1969, 
He was a member of the faculty at Harvard University in both the Department of Government and the Center for International Affairs. Today, he is the chairman of Kissinger Associates, an international consulting firm, and a member of the board of directors of many organizations and companies. Among his many books, I'll only mention three. American Foreign Policy, three essays written in 1969. The White House Years, published in 1979. And his most recent book, which I am reading, Diplomacy, which was published in 1994. The Landon Podium over the years has seen many secretaries of state and national and international foreign policy leaders. Today we are pleased to have at Kansas State University one of this century's foremost foreign policy experts. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you one of the great secretaries of state in American history and arguably the most brilliant diplomatist in America today, Dr. Henry Kissinger. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, whenever I hear such an eloquent and fulsome introduction, I'm reminded of a reception which I attended once, where a lady came up to me and said, I understand you're a fascinating man, she said. Fascinate me. It was one of the least successful conversations <laughs> that I have ever had. I sometimes, when my various accomplishments are listed, I like to point out that for a period of time, I was both National Security Advisor and Secretary of State simultaneously. I mention that only because never before and never since have relations between the White House and the State Department been as harmonious as they were in those days. <laughs> I asked one of the trustees of this university last week what he thought I should talk about. And he said, you should talk about the food situation in the world. But I'm not foolish enough to talk about a subject that most in the audience know better than I do. So I will talk to you about uh, the international situation as I see it. From the point of view of the adjustments that are necessary in the thinking of, I would say, all countries in the world, but especially of our own in the new world in which we find ourselves. People talk about a new world order as if it were already here. But a world order emerges only if most of the major countries, and by major country, I mean those countries that are capable of threatening the peace or promoting general welfare. If most of the major countries are satisfied enough with the conditions so that they will not try to upset them by force when there is some standard of what is considered reasonable and some consensus on permissible aims and methods. Such a condition does not now exist. And it does not now exist because almost every country finds itself in a world for which little 
in its history prepares it. I was talking to some, to your president actually, before I came here. And I made the point that in an understanding of politics, technical knowledge is not as important as an understanding of the historical forces that shape the world. The German statesman Bismarck once said, the best a statesman can do is to listen carefully to the footsteps of God as he marches through history, try to get a hold of his cloak, and walk with him a few steps of the way. And I believe this to be true. If we go around the world, the United States was brought up in an environment in which we have never had a powerful neighbor, in which we were protected by two great oceans, in which really until 1945 we did not have to conduct any foreign policy. Americans thought that whether they participate in international affairs was entirely their choice and that they could participate and withdraw as they saw fit. The experience of almost any other nation in the world, which is of an environment that could be potentially hostile, in which decisions are imposed and not selected, has never, had, has never been in foreign policy an American experience. About 15 years ago, at the height of the Cold War, I gave a speech in Omaha to a business group, and I talked about the dangers of the Cold War. And in the question period, somebody got up and said, you can talk about the dangers of the Cold War, but what would anyone want from us here in Omaha? Now, the headquarters of the Strategic Air Command was just down the road. And the one city in America guaranteed to be attacked on the first day of the war was Omaha. That had not penetrated into the consciousness of the local leaders of the community. So America, at the end of World War II, had close to 50% of the world's gross national product. And it had a nuclear monopoly. If you read carefully what we were thinking and saying at the time, we really conducted foreign policy almost like domestic policy. That is to say, it was a question of allocation of resources. Any problem we recognized as a problem, we could overwhelm with resources and we had dominant military power. Today, we have some 20 to 22 percent of the world's gross national product. We are still the most powerful nation in the world. We still have the largest economy. We still have the most powerful military force. But mathematically, with 22% of the world's gross national product, we cannot do everything, which means we have to be selective, which means we have to know what matters and what doesn't matter to American security. When I see statements by our administration that we have an obligation to bring peace anywhere where it's threatened in the world, It is a violation of the reality in which we live. We can only do it where it affects our security or the security of indispensable allies. 
we cannot go all over the world slaying dragons. <clears throat> and uh, this is one fundamental change in our environment. Secondly, when you have 22% of the world's GNP, you're in the situation where if all the rest of the world, or even all the industrial rest of the world were to unite against us, they could, over time, threaten our economy and indeed threaten our security. So we have an interest in maintaining a balance of power in the world. That's a new experience for Americans. We used to sneer at the British who did this with respect to Europe. We now have to have a concern with respect to the global situation. I repeat, all this is new to Americans. We have tended to believe that we could bring peace by spreading democracy all over the world. And we equated foreign policy with a kind of missionary work. And we have tended to divide our approach between those who thought foreign policy was a subdivision of psychiatry <laughs> and others who thought foreign policy was a subdivision of theology. <laughs> and neither of them is adequate to the present situation. Now, when we go around the world, we find other countries all in similar positions. The European nation state dominated world affairs till 1945. It is now too small to play a global role. And they're trying, it is trying to form a unified Europe and then raising all the questions, where does Europe begin and where are the borders of Europe? Russia finds itself now in borders that it has not had since Peter the Great for 400 years. It was composed of 15 republics which were really subjugated colonial regions, all of which have now become independent. Russia is by far the largest of these and has the vastest territory. But if you observe the Russian domestic discussion, it is really about regaining the empire. And the foreign policy problem we have with Russia is not the domestic politics of Moscow, which is what too many of our journalists and too many of our political figures think. The foreign policy problem we have with Russia is whether it can be kept within the borders that were established internationally after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And you have to remember that it's still a vast territory. St. Petersburg is closer to New York than it is to Vladivostok at the other end of the country. Vladivostok is closer to Seattle than it is to Moscow. So you would think the Russians should not be claustrophobic. <laughs> but last week, I came home from China on a private plane and we la landed at the Siberian city of Khabarov and an unbelievable haggle developed about whether we could get fuel there, which led me into a discussion with the local head of the customs department. And his basic concern was, when will Russia reacquire 
Ukraine, as Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and all these other countries that are now independent. And this is at the furthest corner of Russia you can almost be. So this is the adjustment Russia has to make. Japan was isolated for 400 years, an empire for about 90, an economic institution for 50 after the end of the war, but is now coming back to playing a national policy and China, humiliated in the 19th century, isolated until 1971, has the fastest growth rate of any country in Asia and in the world. And India is also emerging as a major player. So those are the <coughs> key countries about which I want to say something. Now, Americans have a tendency to believe that all foreigners are a species of misunderstood Americans. I have a friend who is of the view that there is no such thing as an English accent. He thinks the English put this on to intimidate Americans. <laughs> and that if you only can catch an Englishman unawares, like waking him up at four in the morning, he will talk like a normal human being. <laughs> that is a little bit our attitude towards foreign policy. And we find it very hard to understand that different histories produce different conceptions. Take Russia. Russia has never been a democracy. Russia has never had a market economy. Russia has always been an empire. Russia has always dominated or tried to dominate its uh, surrounding state. Russia has never had a separation of church and state so that the church has really been a state institution. And all of these factors have produced a tremendous tendency towards authoritarianism and towards conquest. And when a nation behaves in a certain way for 400 years, you have to assume that it has a certain proclivity in that direction, or they wouldn't be doing it. I believe the outcome of the Russian election is marginally important. But we should stop being obsessed with domestic politics in Russia. We have for too long been obsessed with Gorbachev, now with Yeltsin. There is no magic cure for Russian foreign policy by America selecting a favorite candidate and then campaigning in effect campaigning on his behalf. <clears throat> what Russia is doing now is trying to regain great power status. The Yeltsin foreign policy is not significantly different from what alternative foreign policies will be, maybe a little less strident. The key in our relationship with Russia for the immediate future is to get across the proposition that in that vast territory that I have prescribed, they have a huge challenge to build up their own society. But that if they keep bringing pressure on all of their neighbors, sooner or later, 
some version of international tension will reappear. And we have not gotten that across because we have acted as if the relationship was an essentially psychiatric one between our president and the Russian president rather than an objective one based on Russian conduct. Now let me say a few words about China. I understand that there are some Chinese students here. And they know how much I like their country and how often I've visited it. But I always say in China, as I do here, President Nixon did not open to China because he is sentimental. And the last thing anyone has ever accused Mao Zedong of is that he was sentimental. We dealt with each other across a vast ideological gulf for the reason that Mr. Landon mentioned in the inaugural Landon lecture. It is not possible to imagine a stable Asia and a peaceful world without some effort to deal with China and hopefully with a good relationship between China and the United States. Now China is a totally different society from ours. First of all, they've been around for 5,000 years. And of course, we have to remember, for all but 200 of those, we didn't exist, so they had to manage without American advice. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, there have been 22 Chinese dynasties. Seven of those have lasted longer than the entire history of the United States. Six of them have lasted as long as the entire history of the United States. So you're talking about a different rhythm. If you ask an American or a European when something happens, happened, he gives you a date. When you ask a Chinese when something happened, he gives you a dynasty. Now you are within 300 years of when it happened. When you travel in China, you rarely come to a province that does not have a larger population than the largest European country. So one has to understand that governing a billion, 200 million people who on top of it are madly individualistic is a complicated process. When Nixon met Mao, Nixon began the conversation by saying, the chairman's teachings have changed a great civilization. Mao said, no, I have not changed a civilization. I have changed Beijing and a few of its suburbs. So in China, how to make the writ of the central government run in that vast territory with that huge population has been a historic problem. I mention all of this because we have had a tendency to deal with China 
as if our basic objective with respect to China should be social reform, to change its governmental institutions, to bring about a different perception of the role of police, women, and other worthwhile objectives. But of course, the Chinese do not consider it self-evident that we should tell them how to run what they consider their domestic affairs. And the reason they want to talk to us is because of concerns with Japan, Russia, India, and other neighbors. So the problem we have in relations with China is to go back to fundamentals, to separate the desirable from the important, and to recognize that if we want to take on China, as so many heroes of our domestic debate in both parties seem to be eager to do, this is not the same as taking on the Soviet Union. No other Asian country will support us. We'll be alone. And we will be right back to the situation that Governor Landon deplored, that President Nixon overcame, namely that a foreign policy in which we lose contact with China will undermine the flexibility of our American foreign policy around the world. It has nothing to do with whether one likes China or doesn't like China. Now, I have mentioned China and Russia as examples, but one could apply this around the world. Within the next 15 years, India will emerge as a major player. And it will apply some of the experiences of the colonial period when the foreign policy of the British Empire was run from New Delhi and not from London, east of Suez which means that India will try to exert its influence towards Singapore and towards Aden. Now, I could go around the world, but this is not my, my point is not to talk about individual policies. My point is that the United States, given the situation I have described, must learn a more sophisticated approach and a more nonpartisan approach to foreign policy. <clears throat> we are in the position, especially in Asia, where we have fewer quarrels with any of the nations than they have with each other. And therefore, we have the basis for a foreign policy in which we can maintain tolerable relations with everybody and commit ourselves only after we know which is the real threat to stability. We do not have to be the, in the front line of every confrontation. We have to be in the front line of an overall design that we understand. Things are changing, not only nationally, but economically. In ten, within 10 years, we are bound to have an energy shortage, as China and India and Brazil and Indonesia industrialize, the existing energy resources will not be adequate, and therefore, energy reserves in areas that most Americans have never heard of, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan,
Turkmenistan, in the center of Asia, become of great importance. And the direction of the pipelines will become potentially as decisive as what happens to Middle East oil. Five years ago, I saw studies that food would be in permanent surplus and that agricultural companies would have great difficulty unless they consolidated. Now, in this year for sure, there's going to be a global food shortage and it may become congenital if certain <coughs> weather conditions persist. So we need a really much more general and sophisticated approach. And I must stress that while the existing administration will certainly be my second choice in this election, <coughs> the uh, approach should be in evolve into a nonpartisan approach. And the problem we have as a nation is that we've been too secure. In a place like this, it is hard to believe that what happens in so many different parts of the world can affect and will affect our well-being. And we have another problem, which is getting to be a global problem, and it is this. There's no doubt that computers and television have expanded the range of available knowledge in an extraordinary manner. But they have also made it so easy to acquire it that the ability to form concepts is being destroyed and the imagination is being threatened. When you read a book, you have to imagine it. When you see a television production, it is handed to you, and all you have to do is register it. So when you look at every country, the type of person that was so dominant, say, 50 years ago, under the older educational system is shrink, the number of people are shrinking. And the modern politicians are quick, lip, <clears throat> picture oriented, but can they hold together in their minds all of the elements that are necessary and can they acquire the inward assurance to act like the great presidents have before it was obvious to everybody? Because great leaders are not great technicians or intellectuals. They are the people who have a view of the future and the courage to go there. I have a fr Chinese friend who claims that there exists the following Chinese proverb. I say claims because I frankly do not believe that there exist as many Chinese proverbs as they lay upon us. But at any rate, he says that proverb goes something like this. When there is turmoil under the heavens, little problems are dealt with as if they were big problems. And big problems are not dealt with at all. When there is order, under the heavens. 
big problems are reduced to small problems. And small problems will not obsess us. Our big challenge is first to learn what is a big and what is a little problem. Second, to reduce the big problems to manageable problems. And with all the things I have said, don't misunderstand me. There's no other nation in the world that with all the changes, nevertheless, has the capacity to bring about order, to expand prosperity, and to preserve the peace as the United States does. In fact, we are probably the only nation of which it can be said that the future of international relations depends largely upon ourselves. Thank you very much, and I'll take a few questions. Excellent. 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 Can we fix this light so yeah. that I can see yeah. some of the people? Exactly. I'll have them turn them on. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Excellent. If we could have those two lights off up there so that the secretary can see the audience. Now, um, as you know, we have microphones stationed along where everybody is sitting. And so Dr. Kissinger has agreed to try and answer some of your questions. So if you could move to a mic, and we'll start picking out people for questions. Well, we'll start up here at five. Okay, start up here. Okay, yes, doctor. Dr. Kissinger, just curious how often or how many times a week Bill Clinton calls you for advice on foreign affairs, <laughs> or has he ever called you? Who, oh, Clinton? Uh, would you just rephrase that again? It was something about advice. We're just curious how often, how many times a week, or has Bill Clinton ever called you for advice yeah. on foreign affairs? I must tell you the truth, I have talked to him, but he's usually been more eager to tell me to, that I need advice rather than okay. give him advice. Thank you. Okay, uh, why don't we move over here to mic four. Mr. Kissinger, my husband was a prisoner of war in Vietnam, and I want to personally thank you for all of your efforts to end that war. And I want to ask you if you see any connection between all the things happening in Bosnia uh, as related to how things built up in Vietnam. Uh, Bosnia. Yeah, connections yeah. between Bosnia. Actually, I'm glad, I'm, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because Mr. Reagan was urging me strongly to talk about Bosnia, and I never got around to it. Uh, so uh, I can make up for my transgression now. Uh, I think Bosnia, first of all, Bosnia is a good example of the basic problem that I talked about. The United States public has a, has a tendency to be told uh, that Bosnia is a nation. Uh, and we look at it as if this were an existing political unit. The fact is, in all of history, there has never been a Bosnian state. Uh, Bosnia is, has been the buffer zone between the Austrian Empire, 
and the Turkish Empire between the Catholic religion and the Mohammedan and Orthodox uh, religion. And Bosnia is composed of Serbs, Croats, and Muslims who hate each other so much that when they evacuate a town under this new plan, they take their dead with them. They dig up the, the coffins. Now, therefore, to try to force these three groups to live together in one state is a guarantee for war. I have not been in favor of sending American troops to Bosnia. I have reluctantly agreed to it be because the president had made so many promises that I did not want to undermine American credibility. As long as we are keeping the warring parties separate, we are performing a somewhat useful function. But I noticed today in the New York Times there are several articles that are urging us to try to implement the political provisions of this agreement which call for unification. If we do this, we'll be in a war, and I do not want to sacrifice American lives in Bosnia for the issue of unifying Bosnia. Uh, I think these... <clears throat> I think each national group ought to have the right either to live by itself or to join its compatriots across uh, the border. And if we do get involved in trying to unify it, we will be in a Vietnam-type situation. Okay, Mike Three here. Um, Mr. Kissinger, my name is Mavish, and I'm from St. Xavier. I wanted to ask you that in your time, um, the relationship between the United States of America and China were improved a lot, but after you left, even today we see there are difficulties and problems between the two nations. You built a bridge and it seems it was left half built. Is that bridge ever going to be built between the two nations? I have trouble. Could you, could you speak into the mic a little bit closer? Um, in your time, the relationships between the United States of America and China were improved a lot, but after you left, even today, we see there are difficulties and problems between the two nations. You built a bridge, and it seems it was left half built. Is that bridge ever going to be rebuilt between the two nations? Actually, I'm Did you understand well, that? Uh, she's asking about the PRC in America and the future of our relationships. Did you ask? Let me see. We understood you to ask about the future of PRC American relations between the relationship of, uh, relationships of China and the United States is like nuclear and all those, are they ever going to come to a uh, com complete decision on some certain subjects? If there's somebody there who is less polite than the questioner who will yell at me so <laughs> that I understand it, I have trouble understanding the question. In your time, the relations between yeah. USA and China were improved a lot, but after you left, till today, every day, we see difficulties and problems between the two nations. Why? Oh, last July. <laughs> Why have relations deteriorated? No, the problem in Sino-US relations right now is this. We do not know enough about Chinese history. We do not know that for the, ninth, the whole 19th century, the Chinese felt deeply humiliated by the way the Western nations, not primarily the United States, treated them. And therefore, when the United States appears on the scene and says, you must do this or we will punish you in the following three ways, it creates an impossible psychological block. A lot of these issues that now exist are soluble if they are dealt with on the basis of reciprocity. Take, for example, the issue of nuclear proliferation. The Chinese are 
that, shall we say, at least as intelligent as we are. Therefore, they cannot have any possible interest in spreading nuclear weapons to their neighbors who will threaten them before they'll threaten us. So this is not a hard concept to get across. But if we say to them, if you don't stop the following things, which are usually some esoteric technology, we will punish ourselves by cutting off trade. We are in an impossible negotiating position. If we approached it in a different way, if we said what I've just said, neither you nor we have any interest in spreading nuclear weapons, which I believe to be true. Let's establish two or three principles. Then let's create a technical group to implement these principles. That way, we are not discriminating against them. We are not saying they are particularly guilty. We are applying something to ourselves. About three years ago, we came to them with a missile control regime. They were never asked about it. They never were given a chance to express an opinion. We asked them to sign it. Again, I would make the same point as before. It cannot be in their interest for North Korea or Vietnam or any of their neighbors with whom they have not such good relations to acquire a technology to threaten them. But we have to find a different style in talking to them and separate it somewhat from our domestic politics. A question up here on two. <clears throat> Keeping in mind the United Nations actions of peacekeeping in Somalia, Bosnia, Rwanda, and Mozambique, what do you feel will be the actions or the necessity of the United Nations in the coming century? <clears throat> we went into Somalia in the Bush administration. In other words, and I consider myself a Republican. Nevertheless, I opposed going into Somalia for this reason. Certainly there was starvation there. Certainly there was a civil war. But I do not think the American army has been created to distribute food in trouble spots. And <clears throat> And therefore, while I would strongly have supported and did support humanitarian aid, I did not support sending troops there. Then President Clinton escalated our commitment from the distribution of food to creating a unified democratic state in a country, half of which used to be occupied or governed by Italians, the other half by Britain, uh, which is divided in fierce tribal warfare. And it was guaranteed that we would get involved in the sword of bloodshed that we did, and that we will get involved in, in Bosnia if we try to do the same thing there. So my principle is this. There are a lot of good things we can do in the world and if they involve the expenditure of money, the threshold for American intervention is lower. When they involve the expenditure of American lives, we have to be able to tell the mothers and families why their sons and daughters have been sacrificed, what American interest it serves, even a broad American interest, and so I have, do not favor troops in Somalia, Rwanda, Mozambique. There are terrible things going on. We should alleviate them as much as we can, but we cannot become the fire brigade for the world. Okay, let's try number one up there. Number one. Yes, uh, tensions have recently escalated in Korea, and I'm just uh, curious as to what direction do you think our foreign policy will take over there, and uh, what possibilities China play in the negotiations? OK, 
Okay, try that one again, would you? Speak right into the mic now. I have a question as a uh, reference to Korea. Tensions have recently escalated in Korea, and I'm just wondering what direction you expect the United States foreign policy to take, and what possibilities China play in that? <clears throat> well, uh, let, me, uh, let me answer what I think I understood, which has to do with the sort of complex of Korea, the escalating tensions in Korea. <clears throat> The Korea is geopolitically of great consequence because what happens in Korea will affect the orientation of Japan, importantly, and will affect China. And it's at the intersection of China, Russia, and Japan. And a number of wars in this century, starting with the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, started over the issue of Korea. The North Koreans are probably the most repressive and backward regime that exists right now in the world, and its economy is in such enormous trouble that uh, some people think they may start a war in order to escape their difficulties. I can't really believe this. I think what the North Koreans would like to do is to start enough trouble, sort of a war, so that Washington panics and talks to them directly, excluding the South Koreans. And if we then exclude the South Koreans, then South Korea will become more nationalistic and demoralized, and then all kinds of turmoil could develop there. So I think our basic principle must be that we will not talk to the North Koreans without the South Koreans and not to let ourselves get lured into a separate deal uh, with the North Koreans. As for the Chinese, uh, the Chinese are not instigating this, in my view. The Chinese probably, if you gave them truth serum, would like to keep Korea divided, uh, because a unified Korea is, then they'd have, if they have a unified Korea and a unified Vietnam at their borders, and uh, they have two very powerful countries at their borders. Uh, they therefore will not, in my view, support any aggressive action of the North Koreans. And basically, I've just been there, I am quite convinced that the Chinese would prefer the North and South Koreans to talk to each other and keep everybody else out of it, which is also would be the best for us. The Japanese are almost pathological on the issue of Korea. And uh, they consider it a direct threat to them, uh, potentially. And I'm quite sure they don't want Korea unified. So uh, on the issue of Korean unification, uh, we do not have to accelerate it from the American point of view. We have an interest in preventing a military attack on South Korea because the orientation of so many countries will depend on it. But I believe we would have help on that from China and at least indirectly uh, from Japan. What we must avoid is what I believe to be the mistake we made in that agreement on the Korean nuclear uh, production of a separate United States North Korean agreement which throws everything up for grabs. I think do it. Yeah. I'm told that this is it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.